Hello, Internet. It's me, Aaron. Uh, I first want to apologize. This will be a scripted video, uh, just because I have a tendency to ramble, and although I like to stay in the moment, uh, I want to keep as on track as possible. So there may be edits, and I will try to move as quickly as possible. If I speak too quickly, I will post uh, the transcript so that you can understand what I'm saying. So, without further ado, of evolution, the Big Bang, and Star Trek, why creationism is unnecessary. The majority of the refutation of scientific argument that comes from religious fundamentalists is based on ignorance and the misrepresentation of the science that they are attacking. Now, whether these people are genuinely ignorant or they are intentionally misrepresenting the science in order to set up straw men to attack is irrelevant. The result is the same. The argument made against the science is based on a faulty premise, which is then easy to refute, but not truly the position they claim to be arguing against. Let's take, for example, evolution. I once heard a comedian tell a joke that went like this. If man evolved from apes, why do we still have apes? Well, clearly, to any scientist, any student of science, and indeed anyone who even understands the fundamental workings of evolution and natural selection, uh, this is funny, but only because it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. In order for this joke to be funny in the sense it was intended, it requires the listener to actually believe that evolution refers to a magical event that causes species to spontaneously transform into a completely different species. Uh, it is indeed difficult to believe that there are people on this earth, especially in first world countries, where education should be a universal right, uh, that there are people who actually believe this, but believe it they do, or at least they want other people to believe it, so they will then buy the mystical alternative that these charlatans are selling. It's very strange for atheists and scientists, even religious scientists, to comprehend this level of ignorance, but it is very real and very frightening. This is why we must work hard to ensure that proper science is being taught to all children. No child should be forced to believe anything they are taught. Indeed, science should teach skepticism and independent thought, and I include religion in this, but I digress. No child should be forced to believe in evolution, but we should at least do them the favor of teaching them science so they can decide for themselves what to believe. Of course, evolution does not consist of creatures changing in a puff of smoke. We have observed evolution happening in our lifetimes within germ cultures, mayflies, and other short-lived life forms. Evolution, of course, moves within generations, not days, months, years, decades, or any other set measurement of time. Time is meaningless to evolution. Uh, evolution only cares about generations because it is the steady process of mutation and natural selection that governs how species change. We know that evolution can occur and favor certain mutations. And then these favorable mutations can lead species down separate evolutionary paths, causing schisms or branches in the evolutionary tree. This does not necessitate the ancestor life forms die out. We have species living on this earth today, such as certain strands of cyanobacteria, that have remained virtually unchanged for billions of years. But just because life has come a long way since single-celled organisms, that doesn't mean we shouldn't still have them. When a new branch of the evolutionary tree springs up, it doesn't require that the branch is shot off from to die out. That does happen sometimes, but it is by no means necessary. As far as the Big Bang goes, the argument that I hear quite consistently from religious people is, well, if you're going to believe that the universe was just created out of nothing, why not believe it was created by God? Apart from being a lousy argument for creationism, it's a poor argument against science. Again, this is a misrepresentation of the science they are supposedly attacking. First and foremost, as Richard Dawkins observed, if there is a god, and he or she or it is a creator, then it is a life form. As we have noticed, complex life forms occur later on in time, as a necessity. Life begins as single-celled organism, then works its way up to Democrats and Republicans, not vice versa. Surely a creator deity would be the most complex life form possible, able to shape, nay, create the world, the universe? Even if you want to completely ignore that aspect and use the old, well, God exists outside of science defense, and a flimsy one it is, I will concede that it is impossible to prove the non-existence of God, although I would stand by Occam's razor and argue that the burden of proof lies on the side making a positive assertion. Because if we believe that the burden of proof lies on the skeptical side, on the side that says I will not believe without proof, 
Suddenly everything is backwards. Imagine if court worked that way. I accuse you of, say, witchcraft, and instead of me having to prove that you are a witch, you have to prove that you are not a witch, or you burn. We've seen this happen before, and it's not pretty. It's not justice, and it's not rational. But I digress, again. <clears throat> if we believe the universe was created out of nothing, well, that's not really what the Big Bang is all about. We know that matter and energy, particles and waves, share more similarity on the quantum level than traditional physics had ever thought. And under extreme pressure and temperature, like a diamond produced from a coal, under the right conditions, energy and matter can be in a state of flux. Consider plasma, and then think about the even greater temperatures that are produced in the fusion reactions of stars. Indeed, it is theorized that when the universe as we know it was just born, electromagnetism, gravity, and the weak and strong nuclear forces were all fused in one unified force. So, okay, big deal, you might say. So under extreme conditions, it may be possible for energy to be converted into matter. What does that prove? There was no energy at the beginning, right? Wrong. We don't know for sure where it came from, but there was energy in our universe before the Big Bang, or at least at the exact instance of the Big Bang. Brain theory and the cyclic universe model hypothesize that perhaps we are living on a thin slice of existence, that our universe is but one of many extraordinarily thin membranes in a four or more dimensional multiverse. And then the Big Bang was only the most recent of cataclysmic collisions between these membranes that triggered a reset of sorts. Now we don't know for sure this is what happened, it's merely conjecture, but it has a certain elegance and simplicity to it. For people who fail to grasp the idea, it may seem that it's just as likely there is an intelligent force at work, but if all we really need to get this whole thing started is a little energy, why is a god even necessary? If all god did was light a match, can you really give him credit for life in all of its form and splendor? So there is at least a bit better of a model of the Big Bang than merely saying, well, it just happened. I am by no means an expert on the subject. I am not a theoretical physicist. If you would like to learn more about the origins of the universe, I highly recommend A Brief History of Time and the Universe in a Nutshell by Stephen Hawking. If you'd like to learn more about evolutionary biology, I highly recommend that you read Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, the original first print, or uh, Richard Dawkins' The Blind Watchmaker, and perhaps Stephen Jay Gould's Wonderful Life, amongst others. If you'd like to know more about string theory and brain theory, I wholeheartedly urge you to read The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene, or to at least watch the Nova television miniseries based on the book, presented by the author. Indeed, if you don't wish to take the time to read any of the aforementioned books, at least do yourself the favor of watching this program. It's entertaining and simplistic enough not to bore you or confuse uh, you if you're not well versed in science as you might like to be, uh, and informative and intriguing enough to whet the appetite of just about all but the most anti-scientific amongst us. Now, to tie everything together, things like the evolution of complex life, and even more so the Big Bang, seem impossible to our human minds because of their grand scale. But the largest factor in all of these things has been that which we don't take the time to think about most of the time, and that is time. Uh, what I mean by that is this, it's simply not possible to truly comprehend the vast quantities of time that have passed. So that all of this, computers, the internet, YouTube, could be here. Cosmic microwave background radiation tells us that the universe as we know it is approximately 13 billion, 700 million years old, give or take about 200 million. Now, some fundamentalists actually believe that the Earth and the universe is only around 6,000 years old. I'm going to pause for a second to let that sink in. The margin of error for the actual age of the universe is 33,333 times that which some people believe to be the actual age of the universe. Just the margin of error for how old it is. When you compare the actual age of the universe to the paltry 6,000 years some people still claim to believe to be the age of the universe, it is actually 2,283,333 times the age the fundamentalists believe it to be. 13.7 billion years. That's a lot of time, to say the very least. The Earth itself is a scant 4.6 billion years old, still 766,666 times the 6,000 measly puny years claimed by fundamentalists.